is Mike Tatino with the Safety First Home Inspection Show. So thank you for having me. It was an absolute course. pleasure. Love being here. I love chopping it up with you. <laughs> Catherine, thank you so much. No, really thank you. I'm proud of you, man. Good for you. I like it. This is a safety first home inspections podcast. This is my number one episode. There's a not there's a lot of number ones in this introduction. My first number one guest is the number one reason why I'm taking action to start my own podcast show. He's my number one mentor. He's also the number one fix and flip investor on all of Long Island. Charles Weinrub, thank you so much for coming on my show. Really appreciate it. I'm proud of you, man. Good for you. you. I like it. Uh, you're definitely the reason why this is starting. So hopefully people watching this can be inspired also to take action on whatever course of whatever their journey may be calling to just take action. Amen. So let's start out with, we actually met a few years ago because I was wholesaling a deal mm -hmm. to another investor. Oh yeah. So they were, long story short, they were giving me a hard time. They were back and forth. They just weren't moving forward, wasting my time. So you were my second runner up. I didn't know you at the time, so otherwise I would have called you first. But you found me on social media, yes. right? Just from like Facebook. 100%. Yeah. So I saw what you were doing. I reached out to you and you were literally like, give me like half an hour. Let me just make some calls, do my due diligence. I'll have an answer for you. Within that half an hour, you said everything you, you did everything you said you did. We locked in the deal. I got paid. No problem. There wasn't like any delay. And I was like, wow, this is like the smoothest transaction I've ever wholesaled before. So what's the importance of delivery, you know, having funds available and, and just moving forward because real estate is very time sensitive. So how important is that to just, you know, move forward quickly? So um, your reputation is everything, right? And my, my buddy Val is a statement. It's, um, it takes a lifetime to establish a reputation and a moment to lose it. It's very easy to do a lot of business. You just can't be full of shit. 99.9% .9 of people are full of shit. They're going to say they're going to do something. They're not going to do it. When you actually say you're going to do something and then you do it, it immediately rockets you up to, you know, number one in like the 0.001% of people that are doing business just off the strength that you deliver what you say. And that definitely set the standard for me working with you. I was like, you know what? The next opportunity that I have, whether I'm wholesaling another deal, I'm like, I know this guy's quick. He, he There's no hesitation. So that that showed me that the importance of just, you know, being on top of your business. Now, you're you're the number one investor of Long Island now, but how long did it take for you to actually get there? How long have you been an investor for? So it's been six years. So it probably took me about three years to get to that point by uh, by my standard. But before that, it took me, so I trained with Carl, who now you're working with, Correct. which is very cool. Uh, I'm very excited for you for that. That's going to be a Thank life you. changer. I trained with Call for like somewhere between three to four years until I was ready to actually do a deal. Then it took me an entire year to get my first deal. Then it took me about three years or so to get to the point where we we're doing, you know, triple digits. So it definitely didn't happen overnight. No, <laughs> absolutely not. Plus, I was I had a previous business that I was transitioning from one to the other. So I've been in business since I'm 23 years old in general. So what made you wake up one day and say, you know what? What I'm doing now, I think I'm going to transition into real estate. So I never, like, I never really loved it. I got into it because my father owned a Mako Body Shop franchise in Brooklyn, and I had an opportunity to get in extremely cheap because this this Mako that I ended up buying was already set up to be a Mako. So with like sixty thousand dollars, I I opened a business, and um, I liked it, but I never loved it. And then I read Rich Dad Poor Dad, and I was like, oh, this is what I want to do. You know, I, I did the Mako because a fear of regret. I didn't want to miss out. My father's like, this is a great opportunity. And it was because I learned a lot at a very young age. You know, at 40 years old, most people that are in business are just getting into business in their 40s. I've already been in business for half of my life. Right. And then, so how does someone even get started? Like, what's, what's the very first step to, you know, because I feel like now, especially on social media, uh, there's a lot of new up and coming investors and, but from your standpoint, how does someone get started? What's the first step? Social media provides a lot of smoke and mirrors. Definitely. Of perception is reality, which um, I see it kind of like as a superpower that you can either use for good or bad. Um, for me, every venture that I get into it starts with education. So you really need to prepare get the education, build a proper team like you're doing now with Carl sure. to get to the point where you, you never know everything, but you get to the point where you're not going to get hurt. And then you take the leap and then you learn like, let's say the last 30% 
as you're out there and you're always constantly learning every day. Which takes years. Years. Definitely. Years. It is really, I mean, when you really think about it, it takes three to five years to get a business going and it takes 10 years to get real traction. So, you know, now that I'm on social media, I went to Brewery 3, you were Brewery yes, 3. of course. And everybody that was there was like 25 to 35 and they're like, yo, bro, you freaking blew up last year. Nobody had any idea who I was until I was on social media, but they yep. didn't see... Essentially, it's it's a ten year block. Absolutely, it's it's four years of education and six years of actual practice. It's funny you say that because everything I'm doing now, within the last year and a half, I would honestly say just my my path has just been just keep going up and up. Just you know, just little yeah. milestones that I always celebrate because I I never take things like that for granted. But people don't realize this is probably my seventh year as an entrepreneur, and the last year and change is where it's finally the traction starting to build up. Of so, course. You know, it, I, I definitely know that. Um, so up to this point, 2021, how many properties are you, how many properties are you flipping annually at this point? So I do anywhere between 70 and 110 right now on average, plus commercial development, plus rental type stuff. So, so a lot going on. <laughs> a lot going on. I actually, last week was a massive week for me. I got a 138 bed assisted living facility project wow. approved in Farmingdale Village. I've been wow. working on this for over a year. It's going to be four stories, 138 yes. beds on a 1.1 acre site. It's freaking crazy. So someone like someone like yourself who, who's building this business and it's so had so many things going on, what do you do to like de stress? Not business related. Like mm -hmm. what? What's your hobby outside of work? To just whether it's riding a bike or what is it? <laughs> That's it the has thing. To be something. I've actually been thinking about it lately. I'm like, <laughs> I don't really have any like hobby. Like work really is my hobby. It, there's a certain level of stress, but it's like it's the stress that I like. It's like the stress of playing the game. Action. Yeah, I, I like uh, I like being a business person because it's essentially the professional sport that never ends. Of course, right? You can play it at any age; it doesn't matter. Um, you know, there's I work out, I ride a bike. I definitely I started playing a little bit of tennis. Really. I, I definitely need uh, I definitely need a little bit more. I'll use balance for balance. lack of a better word, even though I don't really believe in balance uh, to kind of like you know take my mind off of it. Definitely. So. Up to this point, who would you say had would probably have the biggest impact on your life and why? I can't say it's been one person. So I, I've had four. Let's see, I've had four great mentors in my life. You're one point. of mine, so definitely. Uh, I'm honored to be that guy, man. That's awesome. Course. And uh, and listen, it's a testament to you. Like I've been following since I've met you. I've been following your you know success in your pro process, and you've been diligent, doing exactly what you say, documenting the whole thing, which is very cool. Yeah. Because when you get to look back, and when your kids Absolutely. get to look back, it's sure. like, hey, listen, this was me in a pandemic, yeah. making a squat <laughs> rack out of two by fours yeah. and like, right. <laughs> and, and, and concrete, like yeah. straight Flintstone stuff, yeah. you know, squatting in my backyard. Like, this is where it started and this is where we are now. So it's very cool. So I had, I had four great mentors in my life. I had Carl. Real of course, of course. I had uh, a gentleman who's no longer here. His name is Les Jansen, who was like, was a real estate mentor who was kind of like the, the alter ego of Carl. Like Carl's a very methodical, he's an engineer by trade, you know that. Mm -hmm. So he's like a very methodical, very like, you know, structured, organized type of guy. And then Les Jansen Sr. was his name. He was uh, like a wheeler and dealer, used car dealer, like fly by the seat of its pants type of guy. So those two people together combined with who I was sure. made me today. Uh, my father had a partner in the Mako his name was Steve, and uh, he was a classically trained salesman. He used to sell Electrolux vacuum cleaners door to door in the '70s. Wow! So he was trained under the mentorship of like Zig Ziglar and Tommy Hopkins during a day, uh, the golden age of sales that I don't think really exists anymore. Right. So he trained me the professional sales process, which is again something that's pretty much lost. And then my father has been an entrepreneur for his entire life. So up to this point, so. What I've learned is that when you have multiple when you have multiple mentors, you take a little bit from each, then you add your own, you know, spin into it, and then you pay it forward, which it, all the people that you're helping out now. Do you have any clue how many people you're you've inspired up to this point? If you could put a number on it, <laughs> I have no. You know what it is? I never. Um, I don't. I, I hope it's a lot, just because it's good to give back to the ecosystem. And I love to see people doing well. Of course. I re. I just started putting out content to put out content because I just thought it was an interesting thing to do. The byproduct of that, of all this kind of stuff happening is is very, very rewarding. But it's only been really recently, like I would say the past few months, where I feel like people are really starting to take action at scale. Yes. Now, is there, there has to be one, whether it was a letter, a DM, or Facebook message, 
what's what's the most touching message that someone's ever reached out to you and said, you know, Charles, because of you, I've done this or, or this happened because I either watched a video or I met you here. What's that? There has to be at least one message that might have stood out just a little bit more than others. There's not necessarily one that stands out. There's there's a lot. I get I get DMs and messages on like really pretty much a daily basis of people saying, and I was at Brewery Three, good example. A kid came up to me and he's like, listen, man, I want to let you know I was working at Amazon. I was packing boxes. I listened to every one of your podcasts. Now I'm licensed. I'm training and wow. I'm going to be into real estate. Or, you know, people are like, listen, I watched all your videos and now I did my, my first rental property and I want to buy 10 in the next 10 years so that I can retire. I'm going to be able to send my kid to college now. Or uh, I was on uh, Tim Galligan's podcast last week. I had never met him before. And he's like, I want to watch that one. He's like, I, I want you to know that we're sitting here right now because you told me in a video that I should do yeah. this. And then you talked to me about in a video about the abundance mentality, which yes. completely shifted my mindset. And now I'm just giving selflessly and I have a team of 10 plus agents and we're crushing it. Of course. Yeah. And that's, that's, we're definitely going to get into that. And when I did my 2020 wrap up, my compilation of my, my progress, I was like, there's no way. Yeah, I, that was awesome, dude. Thank you. Thank, thank you to Matt Our Visual, of course. Um, I couldn't have put. I couldn't have made that video without having a specific portion like handsome home buyer definitely has to be in this video because you know that's a i feel like that's a huge that that was a huge push for me because this content you're putting out it's legitimately laying out the blueprint and what i do is <clears throat> which i know you've seen is every day like i'll post my daily habits waking up in the morning reading at 4 a.m working out at 5 a.m and Believe it or not, there's multiple people who have messaged me like, because of that, I'm waking up earlier now. Oh yeah, I'm starting to work out now, and I'm Without like, that. and then you'll get like crazy. that. Then you'll get that one dick who's like, nobody cares. It's like <laughs> that just happened to me. Uh, matter of fact, someone commented on my 2020 compilation video. It was someone who I went to high school with that I was friends with for years, and he's exactly that. He said nobody cares or something stupid like that. And at that point, I was like, I'm, I'm in. I'm in a path right now where I don't have time or energy to to feed into that. So I literally just deleted him off my list. Block. I was like, that's it, gone. I'm not even dealing with it. It's just if you're not supporting what I'm doing right now, then I just don't need you around. Yeah, it's I, I've gone through different phases of that. Originally I was the same way and I would just block somebody because I'm like, I don't want any negative energy around me. Of course. Now I look at those people and I just kind of like I just kind of feel sad for them. It is, yeah. It's definitely sad that they have to you know, put, put that out there to people who are taking action, helping other people. But that's something I'll just never understand. People are crazy, but speaking of crazy, <laughs> speaking of crazy. So after all the houses you flipped, after all the people you've networked with and, and saw houses, what, what's the craziest real estate experience you've ever encountered, whether it was looking at a property or <sighs> the craziest house I've ever, I think I've, I think I've told this story a couple of times. The, um, the craziest house I've, I mean, dude, I've been in and out of houses that have 300 yards of freaking garbage. There's fleas <laughs> bellowing out the uh, door. There are, pot, there are dead animals buried in garbage. I found like an ancient cat burial ground in somebody's basement. Wow. Mountains of human shit, <laughs> animal shit, people living Damn. in there, crazy squatter stories, police. I mean, dude, I've had to run out of my house twice in the last three weeks for squatter for squatters breaking into houses. Saturday, I run out. Squatter's breaking into the house in a stolen car with bogus plates. He has multiple warrants out for his arrest on drugs. Wow. They bring him out of the house, start smashing his face up against the glass oh. of his car, flipping out. The cops say to me, he'll be out in four hours. It's just... That happened to me recently, too. I think oh, I told yeah, you yeah, about Brentwood, that. Brentwood, Brentwood. Yeah. Yeah, you got lucky. You got really, We both got lucky. We, we got, got really lucky. lucky. So we had a final walkthrough. Um, so for those who may not know... I flip houses, not as much as Charles, but from time to time, I'll flip a house or two a year. But we were flipping a house and we had a final walkthrough scheduled on a Tuesday. And Saturday night at like 10 o'clock at night, the buyer calls me directly. He's like, Mike, I was driving by the house and there's curtains up, there's cars in the driveway. I'm like, wait, what? I flew down there and luckily, like you said, uh, they were only there for maybe two, two to three days. So they didn't really have much grounds to stand on. Well, they don't have any because it's not their house, but... Uh, luckily we got the cops, uh, the cops got them out that night, but that could have turned into a whole nother. Yeah, man. I got to give a shout out to the Suffolk County police department Definitely. because they, that could go a lot of different ways. Like they could be like, Oh, this is a civil matter, but I think they're just so fed up and they know what's going on mm -hmm. that they're just like 
f these people. Yeah, of course. Like you know, I had I same very same scenario. The I had a house in Huntington Station three weeks ago. Buyer drives by, calls up yeah. the agent. It's Dan O'Neill's guy, and he's like, "Are you renting the house?" Yes. Dan exactly. calls me. Yeah. I'm like, "What are you talking about?" <laughs> they have like something written up in like crayon with the wrong yep. address. Yep. It's just it's it really sucks, man. Yeah, and it's funny because when the cops. When they opened up the door, the first thing, they, sm they were smoking in the house. It yeah. was just like, it was... They don't care. It was a mess. But luckily, you know, once we got them out the next morning... Funny thing is, the next morning, they broke in again. So we wow. came in the next morning. That's ballsy because they it's on record. My partner, I wasn't there because I had to do a home inspection. But my partner went back to make sure, like, we changed the locks and everything. They were back in the <laughs> house that, that morning. And did they lock them up at that point? They just left. The guy, my partner was just like, get out of here, and they just left. Yeah, it's bad, man. I had one in, in CI where I walked in. The guy had his mint house. Guy has his dog in there. The dog's shitting on yeah, the floor. It's, it's like, bro, why? Like, it's just some of this stuff it's is- crazy. And the crazy part is some of these people are generationally trained to do this. Yes. Yep. They're generationally trained to do this. Like, super important. You need to have- It's an issue for me because at any given time, I have anywhere from 60 to 70 unoccupied houses that are either under construction or on the market awaiting closing. Mm -hmm. So it's hard for me to alarm these things. Of course. But otherwise, you need to have, like, if you're doing any less than 20 a year, you need to have alarms in all Definitely. of your houses. And that that experience taught me, too, the minute I acquire a property, make friends with all the neighbors, and tell them, listen, if if you see anyone at nighttime, you know, give me a call, let me know. Absolutely. So that's that whole process taught me a lot. So um, speaking of processes and, and learning you mentioned there was one deal in particular where after everything was said and done, I think you made like 1200 bucks. Oh, the curse of my ex-wife, dude. Yeah, the so, curse of my ex-wife. So I didn't even think that was possible to to have that happen, but walk us through. And I got like, a great deal on it too, so, I thought. What, like how? Like I just, mean, I bought this house for like, I think it was like 250 or 275 and I sold it for like six and a quarter and I still only made 1200 bucks. How? Cur curse of the ex-wife, dude. <laughs> so basically it was a house, it was a house in Gilgo Beach. So Gilgo Beach is a very unique area. I've never done anything down there. They don't have regular, they don't have water there. They have well water. They don't have like public water. Okay. Anything that possibly could have went wrong, went wrong down there. It was a very expensive property to maintain. It had a, it has, you don't own the land. It's a ground lease. Okay. So you're leasing the land from the town. We started doing some work in there just to see what to get into. And we were filing the permits. The neighbors are like the Gestapo. They called the town oh. on us. They freaking gave us a stop work order. This is before Captain Permit. Right, right. The, um, the expediter I was using at the time, which is, this was the, this was the final straw why I started Captain Permit. This guy disappeared with my money for nine months. It just, it just got worse. Plus the oh, house was 3,600 square feet. It was a total wreck disaster. By the time it was all done, the taxes were like 25,000 a year. Plus the ground lease was like 3,500 a year. By the time we were done, I made $1,200, wow. which, which I consider a win. Definitely. Of course. <laughs> Given everything that went on, Definitely. I consider that a win. It's funny because when, when we first... That's kind of like my Brentwood deal because I actually was wholesaling it to another investor mm -hmm. who, once again, they said they were going to move forward and then 99% of them are just full of shit. Yeah, dude. And they said the money's there. They wasted my time. So then I actually had to close on the property because, you know, you have 30 days to. Yeah. So we had to close on the property. Luckily, I have a I have background in construction. So does my partner. So it wasn't even our plan to even renovate his house. The house is occupied. Luckily, we got the uh, we got the guy out within thirty days. We gave him cash for keys, and we started the renovation process. COVID happens, like in the middle of Reno, construction shuts down. Now, I could say this now because it's already done, but we had to kind of like go shut the curtains, and you know, we had to one hundred percent. We had to. You have to do it. We have to, yeah. No so, one's paying your bills, bro. Exactly. So we kind of just had to. All right, go under the table and, and still renovate the house, and. They, we couldn't do any showings, no open houses. So now that the house is ready to hit the market, we're not getting traction, COVID, people losing their jobs. And then on top of all of that, we had the squatter at 48 hours. Pro just That's like, nice. But you you had a streak of luck, which was COVID essentially boosted the values on Long Island through the roof. So Absolutely. the cool, it, like you went through all that adversity, which is awesome. And then like the silver lining on the end was values just went. Yes. And we made money too, so yeah, which is and a win, which I wasn't even anticipating because I just thought like, 
like just what else can go wrong. But luckily that wasn't the issue. But it's a good experience. And then you and I had that conversation and I was like, listen, you know, people want to flip houses because they love it because they think it's sexy. It makes money. It can make money. Yes. But you want to buy rentals ultimately because that's how you create generational wealth. How you get the money to do that doesn't matter. If you do a million home inspections and get the money or if you flip a million right. houses, it doesn't matter. But if you try to do everything, it's going to be a hot mess. I, re I specifically remember calling you. I was parked outside of the house and I was just I was up to here with like just dealing with the contract, running back and forth and going to Home Depot, loading my truck up with material. I was just like, Charles, how do I do? Like just, yeah, you know, and, and luckily I have you on speed dial if I need help or, or guidance, things like that. So I definitely appreciate that. Um, so for the new investors out there, what are some things that that what are some issues that people will run into regarding permits? And I know you said you run Captain Permit. Mm -hmm. um, Tell us about that. So uh, I opened Captain Permit out of frustration because I couldn't get my own permits done. And it's not even so much the fact of like expediting it through the building department because that kind of stuff doesn't really happen in the same way. There's so much volume of permits and you know the, the building departments have come under such scrutiny with things that have gone on. It's just about navigating the process and understanding. So, I mean, after years of just dealing with expediters and wasting so much money in carrying costs, I finally got into it myself. So the big thing is preparation. The moment you look at a house, you, you want you want to have somebody on your team, whether it's Captain Permit or somebody else. The moment you get a house, before, way before you close, before you even go into contract, you want to call them and find out, you know, what are the little intricacies that of this particular property. And I'll give you a stupid example. Let's say you're in the town of Hempstead, you have a house in Levittown, you have a traditional Levitt style home. Mm -hmm. they no have basement. No, no basement, right. they have garages on them. If you convert, so in Levittown, you need, it's a 60 by 100 lot, you need a combined side yard setback of 15 feet, which means that from the house on the right side to the property line and the house on the left side of the property line together has to equal a total of 15 feet. Mm -hmm. If you were to go and convert the garage and you don't have that 15 feet, you have to go for a variance, which could be a four to nine month process. People don't know that stuff. So you're buying a house, you're renovating it, whatever. All of a sudden, you're about to close. You realize you need oh. a variance. It's six to nine months out. If you knew that up front, you could have factored in for an extra $5,000 in costs. You could have you know, started uh, to get that process going at the very beginning. So little things like that. Once you have it under contract, you should definitely call your expediter at that point if you don't feel comfortable prior. When you get the title report in, you should absolutely send that over because no disrespect to the attorneys that are out there in this wor in the real estate world, mm -hmm. and I would love to do a workshop for them, but it's so hard to like of course. get them together because attorneys do a million different things. Yeah. But they are clueless. They don't know. So they don't tell people about CO violations, open permits, missing permits. When you have violations on a property, I'll give you an example. Let's say in the town of Hempstead, you have no open permits, you have nothing. You gut renovate the house, you get away with it, like, yeah, F captain permit. I didn't need to pay that guy. <laughs> but you have a violation for an illegal apartment in the basement. So it comes up on the title port, we're going to sell it to the seller. The attorney's like, you got to get this off. All right. So you call the town, say, how do I get this off? Oh, we're just going to come over and do an inspection, make sure there's no second kitchen in the basement. Yeah. Awesome. They come in, what? You renovated this house. Tear you apart, yeah. I need permits for everything in this house. Now you're two weeks away from the closing. You're freaking out. Jeez. You're calling us. You're pissed. If you would have known this at the beginning, you could have sent the, the town in before you started renovations, taken it off, and then tried to do your your underhanded shit. Of course, yeah. Do it the smart way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. So that's some advice for new investors. Um, now, you're doing something... Regarding uh, with JB, Dan O'Neill, you're picking 10 realtors? I yeah, believe. yeah, yeah. So what's that all about? So I have this thing, I, I call it broker beef because I mean, no disrespect to the brokerage community, but I feel like the traditional mm -hmm. broker model is get as many agents on there as possible and they don't really give them the value. Mm -hmm. Agents are, 50% of agents don't do anything. Now, is that the broker's fault? No, there's a lot of agents that aren't out there hustling doing right. what it takes. Of course. But there are very few brokers that are really providing the education to their agents in order to have the agent succeed. Sure. There's a lot of reasons for that, not to knock anybody. But so this young lady, um, Amanda Palmieri, starts hitting me up and we start talking just about like marketing strategy and whatnot. I actually met her through your podcast. Um, I We connected from, I think you tagged her on something and then she followed me and I followed her. So nice. once again, it's the power, power of social media. Social media, bro. Yeah. So we start going back and forth and I'm giving her like some advice on things. And I'm like, you know what we're going to do? I'm like, we're going to make this into <laughs> a, like a podcast series. I thought it would be interesting. Yeah. 
So I called up JB because I mean he is the greatest sales trainer on Long Island. Dan O'Neill is you oh, know, of course the poster Rockstar, boy, yeah, yeah, poster boy yeah. for the modern realtor. He's going to be here tomorrow, by the way. Nice. Yeah, yeah. So um, the poster boy for modern realtor. So we put this together, and then the more I thought about it, the more I'm like, all right, we're going to mentor her for a year. We're going to have a podcast with her each quarter, and I'm going to give her full access to all of us. And it's what she makes of it. And then I said, you know what? This would be interesting. I'm going to get a different realtor with a compelling story to come in every month. I'm going to do something similar, mm -hmm. you know, not as much access because they're only having the one podcast, but I think it's good for the ecosystem for all of us to of course, share of ideas. Matter of fact, um, once you posted that, I, I DM the video to a new realtor that I know and she actually emailed you. So who is she? Her name's Claudia. Oh yeah, yeah, so, yeah. I don't know. Ironically, if... that's two. I'm going to call her because that's two, uh, two means of connection. Uh, this guy, Randy, who was like a family friend, mm -hmm. he goes to Uncle Bacala's all the time and she worked at Uncle Bacala's for a long time. Small world. So I'm going to call her, yeah. Awesome, yeah. So there's one thing you and I have in common that people don't know, which um, at one point in time, you and I both took salsa classes. <laughs> I don't know if you knew that or not. I didn't know that, yeah. actually. So I, I took classes. <laughs> it's funny. I, I literally signed up maybe a week after my previous breakup because you like spanish girls dude i do it's careful yeah but um <laughs> i went through a breakup and a week later i was like you know what i can't sit home like i have to stay active just to get my mind occupied of course. about it i legitimately went on groupon the first week and i signed up and i went for six months probably four nights a week where did you go I went to Salsa and Queens in Astoria, okay. Queens. Okay. It was amazing. No, they're awesome there. It's, it's amazing. The best schools are, yeah. are in Queens in the city. But um, breakups are very interesting because a lot of times, like, I'm not going to say 100%, but I had a very, I had a very, very bad breakup. Like, I, like, sort of got married but never got married, and mm -hmm. it was, like, a fucking nightmare. Yeah, yeah. And that breakup and the only emotion that went into that really propelled my career. Cause it's like the first year I was in, I, so first year I did 11 houses, sort of got married and sort of got divorced. And then my second year, you I was single within your second year, you were single now or halfway, like seven months, eight months into my seven months into my second year. That's when my whatever right, right. left me. Mm. And I had bought 10 houses that year. And I bought 30 more houses in the next five months after wow. she left me just due to like sheer emotion that I needed to channel yeah. into something. What made you, what made you take the salsa classes? Just, did you wake up when they say, you know what, let me try something new this time. It was a common. So I, I took, so I always really liked Latin culture. So I've been immersed in Latin culture for probably the better part of 20 years. Because your previous life, you were, go ahead. Uh, in my previous <laughs> life, I was Dominican. Yes. So that's, that's one thing. <laughs> yes. But uh, I owned the body shop franchise. So the majority of my employees from 23 on were mm -hmm. Latino. So, mm -hmm. I, I really like the culture. And then I dated a lot of Sp uh, Spanish women, mm -hmm. which I'm, I'm off that train. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm not. I'm, I'm off that. Not. You'll get there. You just haven't learned yet. <laughs> I'm a little older. I've been doing this a little yeah. bit longer. You'll get there. So, um, and there was that. And I just, you know, I like dancing. I like active. I like to be out there. Um, my ex-wife or whatever was was very, very into it. So that was definitely like, I'm sure like a subconscious play sure. at the end. I was like, ah. And she would never, she never wanted me to dance with her. Really? No, because she was like, you know, out there doing her thing, wanting yeah. attention. It was not a healthy thing. Mm -hmm. So when her and I were finally not together, I'm like, all right, now I have the opportunity. I'm just, I'm going to go do it. Nothing to do with her though, just on your own, just because. No, I, yeah, I guess it was a, it was a healing thing. Mm -hmm. It was a, it was an energy release thing. It was a, you know, now I'm going to do this since I really didn't do this when I was with you. I don't, right, right. you know, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of deep psychology yeah, there sure. that went into that. Of course. But, uh, but yeah, it was, but the interesting thing was. It was kind of like therapy for me. Me too, of course. Because I remember, mm. so I, I was dancing like probably nine to 12 hours a week. That's a lot. Hardcore. Bro, after yeah. nine months, they put me on the performance team. I was wow. fucking dedicated. Wow. I was going to be the number one Jewish salsa <laughs> dancer on Long Island. Did you ever go to socials? Yeah, all own? the time. Oh, you did? Of okay. course, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I would dance all the time. I went for privates and then I went to all the classes. Mm -hmm. I would go to like three classes in a row. And then one day at the end, I was standing there and I took a class and I was like, I'm over my ex-wife. And I never went back. Wow. And then I went to NYU and then right then I signed up for NYU and went back to get my master's degree. That's awesome. Yeah, the the whole the whole uh Tulsa journey for me was it's funny. I actually did it to try to get her back. Kind of like, hey, look, I'm I'm trying new things. I'm I'm, you know, 
evolving this and that. I tried that for the first like two weeks. Mm -hmm. That didn't work. <laughs> but then I realized that, you know what? I should be going here because of me, not because of 100%. anybody else. Yeah. And then I fell in love with it. And then what I've learned too is that if you know how to dance and other people at a social seat, they'll pull you on the dance floor. That's what I've learned from from the salsa, uh, of course, community. So the salsa scene is 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 interesting. Definitely, it's interesting. and it's frowned upon to tell someone no. If they ask you to dance, you like you have to say yes, <laughs> no matter what level they're at, no matter. You kind of have to say yes because if you say no, then it's kind of looked at like, oh well, I think I'm better than you, and you know. But there you go, guys. <laughs> so if you want to dance with a smoking hot girl who literally can't turn you down, you learn the salsa. Exactly. So we went over everything you've exceeded in and and kind of blew i guess everyone's expectations i mean did did anyone that you told early on believe that you're going to be the number one fix and flipper on long island no way right nah everybody was like <laughs> my um my ex-wife was very was very supportive and it's not my parents are very supportive of me it's not but the concept of what we do is pretty out there i mean for us whatever we live in this world mm -hmm. but for somebody who doesn't know anything about real estate, the concept of buying a house that is like a piece of crap mm -hmm. for hundreds of thousands of dollars, renovate it and thinking you're gonna sell it for multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars yeah. later at a profit with other people's money is a pretty mind blowing concept to like the average person. Absolutely. So a lot of people just don't understand it. So what's, what's one thing that you can honestly say that you're just not good at whatsoever, whether it's business related or just what's something you just have no interest on self-improving at all? <laughs> well, I have, well, I have interest in self-improving everything. Of course. But what I'm not good at is I'm not unbelievably organized. Okay. Because I, um, you know, I have ADHD to the max. So I'm mm -hmm. like an idea guy. I'm running around, I'm making deals. Structure and organization, while I know it's super important and I hire people around me to do that for me, I'm personally not good at. What about something not business really like cooking or something like what's another thing that you just like me like i hate cooking mm -hmm. that's just one thing i i've tried to over the years and i'll literally follow the recipe down to the t and it just still won't come out the way that i so i don't know if i believe that <laughs> at this point I, i'm just like you know what just meal preps it is maybe you just don't have an interest in it i don't have an interest in it that's really the thing it's not a matter of i think everybody can be good at something if anything really if mm -hmm. they put their mind to it of course it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be you know, Gordon Ramsay. Right, of course. But you can make a decent meal and not kill somebody. That's true. It's just a matter of what you're into. And listen, there's only 24 hours in a day. How many things can you possibly be into and excel at? Exactly. It's difficult. So if you were in my shoes right now, what's one question you would you would ask yourself that I haven't asked you yet? Fuck, man, that's a hard <laughs> one. You like spend time on these, right? Uh, let me tell you. This is serious, you're going deep. Let me tell you, I, I was telling Rob too, like because this is my first episode. Let's give a shout out to Rob, first of all. Rob, yes, thank you, Rob. Man. I know I know Rob him from a man. past life. I hasn't figured it out yet, but his setup is dope. Yes. And he does an awesome job. And, oh, wait a minute, a huge thank you to Stacy too. Stacy was the one who introduced me to Rob. Olex Properties. Yes, Olex Properties. She got me here, so thanks to both of you guys. But yeah, um, being that this is my first podcast episode, I, I legitimately wrote all my notes down. I, I practiced it. I was in my head, but but now now that we're here, I feel like the ice has been broken. So for those of you guys watching, if you guys were debating on starting your own show, I definitely recommend diving in. But yeah, what's what's one question that I haven't asked you yet that you would ask yourself? See, it's tough because I feel like you know like everything about me. I do. You know everything about yeah. me. I um not in a creepy stalking way. No, 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 no. Because I, I put it out there and you, you have an interest in what I do, which Absolutely, I really appreciate. So you listen to the videos. Sure. Uh, I think it's very important for people to understand that um, there's, um, I'm not going to say loneliness, but there's there's a lot of, you can't really believe all the hype. There's a lot of sacrifice that comes along with, you know, being very successful. And there's people that are far, far, far more, far more successful than me, but there's a lot that goes along with that. You know, I'm, I'm 41. I'm not married. I don't have kids. You know, to a certain extent, not that it, not that I'm lonely per se, but you know, entrepreneurship is a is a is a lonely thing. Absolutely. You know, it just um, and I um, I think it's very important to just understand how you're wired. I am I have an addictive personality by nature. Like I come from you know deep generations of people that gambled, right? So like I don't gamble, I don't do drugs, I don't do anything like that. My addiction is essentially you know, working in what I do now, it just manifests itself in a different way, which works for me. But I guess you just have to really understand like who you are and how you're wired and then design your life around that. So downtime for you, 
it's like me too, but it doesn't exist. Yeah. And even if there's times where I do have downtime, I always think, okay, what can I be working towards right now? So, you know, some people might find Sunday, okay, I get to lay back and watch TV or do whatever it is. But like, if I don't have a home inspection schedule, then I'll start writing notes for my podcast show. I'm, 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 I'm teaching myself Spanish again so I could, you know. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Dude, the it, Spanish thing is huge. Yes. I saw you doing that. I call, I hit up Levy. Shout out to Levy. And I'm like, dude, how do we like get the, <laughs> how do we get everything we do in Spanish? He's yeah. like, you want to do everything we do in Spanish? I'm like, we need everything in Spanish. I tell you, that's a whole nother market. With, that's a whole different. The fastest growing market in the country. Absolutely. And once you know Spanish, I feel like that community is very loyal. And, yes. And they feel comfortable because they know that, they know that, you want to service their needs, whether it's a home in your sense, you know, buying a house, flipping a house. But uh, yeah, that's that's something that I've been teaching myself too. And I feel like people, people, they neglect the small habits. So if you just read, let's say 10 pages every day, guess what? That's that's 300 pages a month. If you exercise half an hour, whatever it is. Of but course. I feel like if you have some type of regimen where every day you time block, which I feel like you do too at some, right? Like, no. Nah. Oh, you don't at all? I mean, I'd love to. Oh, that, really? that comes back to the organization. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like I've seen like Juan Baronetti has every 30 minutes of his entire life blocked out. Like really? literally. Wow. If you look at his phone, his phone is divided up into 30 minute increments. Wow. So some people, it's just a matter of, listen, you got to know who you are. Of course. And then excel at what you do and then hire and partner people around you that do what you do, don't do well, well. Of course. And with that being said, how can people get a hold of you? How can people connect with you, follow you? What's what's your handle? What's Appreciate up? that. I'm I'm everywhere, man. <laughs> I'm, I'm everywhere to the point where I'm I'm haunting your dreams. Like you'll be like, I'm tired <laughs> of watching this guy. But we're on Instagram. It's handsome underscore homebuyer. My name's obviously Charles Weinrab. I'm on TikTok, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter. What am I missing? Instagram. Well, now Clubhouse. Said, I've heard about Clubhouse. What What are your thoughts on that? I haven't really had a chance to super delve into it because there's so many platforms and I'm know, on all these yeah. platforms and it's like, bro, like, how do you man? Yeah. It's I'm trying to like, you know, I have a full-time camera guy, Levy. Now yep. we're cranking out content. We're cranking out five YouTube videos a day. We're putting out anywhere between like 50 and hundred pieces of content a day wow. across all those platforms. Yeah. And it's a lot of freaking work. Of course. So, I mean, really you have to build your own team and, and put it out, but it's, it's just, it's a lot. It's a Definitely. lot. And, and it's, I think people need to understand that it's okay if you're not doing everything perfect. Mm-hmm. You're trying to work through it. It's a process. Of course. But sometimes life just yeah. gets in the way, man. You you definitely have to take action. And, you know, I definitely thank you so much for being on my first first episode of my podcast show. It's an honor, man. You know, I, I hope for the people watching this could, uh, you know, hopefully take something from each and every guest because every one of my guests, I want to add value to some way, somehow, obviously you're an expert in your field and, and, and you've built a tremendous business and the principles that you shared on this show, hopefully someone watching will either reach out to me or you and say, you know, thank you for having Charles on. I really needed that. So that's kind of the purpose of this whole show. So. Yeah, no, it's awesome, man. And again, it's, it's an honor to be here. It's great to watch what you're doing. Thank you. I'm honored to be, to be mentioned as a, uh, as a mentor and you following, 100%. you know, a portion of, of what I do and, and replicating it because it's very cool to see that you're gaining a massive amount of traction. I am. I actually did a, um, there was some type of home inspector networking thing that they asked me to speak on zoom. And I was referencing you is most of them were older mm-hmm. gentlemen. And I, I talked about you the entire time <laughs> really and I'm like, bro, it. yeah. If you guys want more business, I'm like, this is the guy. Like, <laughs> and I can tell him something blue in the face. None of them are going to do it. But what you're doing, like in five years, it's going to be crazy, man. I have a long, yeah, I, I definitely, uh, but it's thanks to you guys. Thanks to, you know, the realtors that hired me. Thanks to investors, people that are coming on my show, uh, recommending me. At this point, I mean, all my work is literally word of mouth. Yeah. So once again, handsome home buyer. Thank you so much. Really Gentlemen, appreciate it. Thanks, thanks for having me, man. No problem.